OK, so number one, uh, find critical points. So we'll go ahead and find a derivative. And from the derivative, we can clean it up. Subtract one from the exponents. So minus five over five becomes three fifths. Minus one or minus five over five becomes negative two fifths. Do a little bit of cleanup. OK, so we want to be able to uh, set the numerator and denominator equal to zero separately. But before we can do that, we got to push this together to be one fraction, right? So here's our common denominator, 5x to the 2 fifths. Balancing the fractions, this denominator to this denominator, I need to multiply by x to the 2 fifths. So numerator gets multiplied by x to the two fifths. If I multiply x's, I'm adding the exponents. So two fifths plus three fifths is five fifths, which is one. Second fraction denominator, there's no changes. So that three will stay. OK, any questions so far? OK, so now we're going to find our critical points. We're going to set the numerator equal to zero and then separately we'll set the denominator equal to zero. Okay, subtract three, divide by eight. Here, divide both sides by five. Raise both sides um, with the power of five halves. Still going to give us zero. Okay, how do you feel about that? Good. All right, number two. Find the values of the absolute extrema. So uh, anything with absolute extrema, this is extreme value theorem. So the purpose of extreme value theorem is to determine what the highest and lowest y values are without the use of the graph. So we're just relying on critical points and endpoints to help us make that conclusion. So if I want to guarantee an absolute max or absolute min, I first have to establish that the graph is continuous. OK, this does not require differentiability because it doesn't have to be smooth curve all the way through. It just needs to be a continuous graph all the way through. So EVT only requires um, continuity. So we have a polynomial basically the easy way to think about this is if there's no denominator variable, you don't have to worry about it. OK, if there's a denominator variable, understand that there could be that vertical asymptote could impact the interval. But here there's nothing to worry about. You know your condition is going to pass. So. Okay. Make sure you state your endpoints. We need some critical points. So critical points comes from F prime. Power rule. So 
set equal to zero, there's no denominator to worry about. So just the numerator. Factor the six out. Solve for x and we get two and negative one. All right, this is where we have to be a little bit careful here because just because we have critical points doesn't mean that we're going to we're going to test every one that we find. What do we have to be careful about? Make sure they're inside the interval, right? So it could be an absolute max, but if you find that absolute max outside the interval, then it's not it's never going to be the right answer. So make sure that you're always safe within your interval. If something is not inside the interval, you're not going to use it. Okay. It's very possible that none of your critical points end up in the interval. If that's the case, you can still go through with EBT. It's just that you have less points to test. You're only testing your two endpoints. But in this case, two is safely inside the interval. Negative one is also safely inside the interval. We have four points we have to test. They all get inserted back into the original equation, original function. Use your calculator. Now we're basing our decision purely by comparing the y values. Okay. Lowest y value that I see is negative 19. Highest y value that I see is eight. So those are my answers. Theorem is EPT. Uh, yes, okay. yeah. But I think Rolls theorem and mean value and mean value theorem. I'll just I'm gonna just tell you because I because I have to tell you if I'm gonna ask you to use it. So yeah, just basically just this one. This is the only one that you really have to name it. Okay, good. Any questions with two? Okay, number three. Determine if Rolle's theorem can be applied. Rolle's theorem is proving whether uh, or uh, guaranteeing a slope zero somewhere along the curve, right? That's the purpose of Rolle's theorem. But to get to that point, there's a couple of things that we have to establish. We have to establish continuity, differentiability. We need to find the y values at the endpoints so, so that we can determine the slope. OK, Rolle's theorem continuity. Uh, is there a potential issue with continuity here? Yes, the denominator variable. We got to be careful about that. So we'll pull that to the side. And we'll look for the vertical asymptote. OK, where's our vertical asymptote? X equals negative two. So there is a break in the graph, but is that break going to make an impact on our interval? No, so we're safe. OK, it will pass the continuity condition. And for now, just know that on the quiz, if it passes the continuity condition, you're also going to pass the differentiability condition. Okay, they're, they're going to go hand in hand. OK, I won't give you one where it passes the continuity, but not the differentiability. There are ones that exist, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Yeah. Right, so absolute value functions are ones that has that condition where it passes continuity, but it fails the differentiability. But I won't give you give that to you okay. on the quiz. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so even if there's a vertical asymptote, it's fine. Yes, because why? Because, because it's not inside the interval. Not. Right. So we always we only care about the interval. It could there could be all sorts of you know things occurring outside the interval, but this is the only issue that that 
it, that is part of our problem. And that one issue is outside the interval, so we're safe. But if it does impact the interval, then we say function is not continuous, and so therefore Rolle's theorem does not apply. Okay. All right, so let's state our conditions here. Uh, continuity is with brackets. Differentiability is with parentheses. And now we bring on the endpoints. Okay, you're going to do the exact same things for mean value theorem as well, right? Continuity, differentiability, order pairs, right? Those things will not change whether you're doing roles or mean value theorem. How do we know it's differentiable? Um, so right now, what I give you, if you can make it past the continuity test, it'll be a smooth curve everywhere else. There's only two conditions, absolute value function, and then strange functions, that's something like x to the two thirds. Right, but I won't give those to you on the test. Why right? do we use brackets for parts? So that's the condition that's required. Um, continuous, uh, in order for Rolle's theorem or mean value theorem to, to, uh, to be true, it needs to be continuous at the endpoints as well. It can't have any holes or asymptotes at the endpoints. So then for like mean value theorem, would it be parentheses for both? No, bracket for continuity. Bracket mm -hmm. Difference, yeah. yeah. For this, what this parentheses mean is that we can get away with sharp turns at the endpoints and it can still pass Rolle's theorem. So that's why the conditions are a little bit different. It it can't be it can't be can't uh, it can't be discontinuous at the endpoints, but it can be non-differentiable at the endpoints. So that's why there's that distinction. Okay, we find our endpoints f of negative one. Insert back into the original function, right? So negative one squared plus two minus three. That's zero over one. Zero over one is zero. F of three. 9 minus 6 minus 3, that's 0 over 5, that's also 0. So technically, we are finding the slope between these endpoints here. And what's the slope going to be? 0. Okay. Because these are because these y values are the same, right? If I'm ever trying to find slope, if I'm subtracting the same values in the numerator, I'm always going to get 0. So that is why with Rolle's theorem, Equal y values will always produce slope zero. But ultimately, it's really the same thing as main value theorem, right? Continuity, differentiability, order pair, slope. It's just that with Rolle's theorem, your slope is always going to be zero because we're looking specifically for the same y values. Okay, so now that you've taken care of everything that you could do with the non-calculus portion, now we're moving on to the derivative portion, right? So now we got to find f prime. But to find f prime, look at the setup here. What is required? Quotient rule. rule, yeah. f prime g minus f g prime all over g squared. Okay, so let me go through this in more detail here. F prime, 2x squared minus 2x minus 3 becomes 2x minus 2. The original g function minus the original f function. And then the derivative of g, which is x plus 2 becomes 1, all over denominator squared. Okay, so we distribute, we clean all this up.
All right. Any questions with F prime and cleaning it all the way to this point? OK, so we're going to set F prime equal to zero. So I'm purposely looking for slope zero. What do I set equal to zero? Or how should you proceed from here? Actually, just the numerator. Why is it just the numerator here, but then with other things, we set the numerator and the denominator equal to zero? Well, I think it's because of the purpose of Rolle's theorem, right? Purpose of Rolle's theorem is we're trying to specifically look for what? We're looking for slope zero. And the only place they're going to find slope zero is from the numerator of the derivative, right? With extreme value theorem, we look in the denominator because we're OK with sharp turns, so we look in the denominator. Um, with first derivative test, we look in the denominator as well because we don't care that it's a vertical asymptote. We still want to place them onto our slope sign line because it helps separate our interval. But with Rolle's theorem, because we're looking for slope zero, the denominator is not going to play a role for us, just the numerator. OK, on the quiz, if you get to this point, I'll give you something that's factorable. This one is not factorable. This is a quadratic formula problem. OK, so I'm going to just skip to the answer here. So quadratic formula, we get negative 4 plus root 20 over 2 and negative 4 minus root 20 over 2. OK, so let's just fast forward to the answer. Um, uh, when we get to our answers, though, if there's more than one, how do we decide whether we can keep either one? Hmm? Yeah, look to see is it inside the interval. It's got to be between. If it's at the end point, it is not good enough. It's got to be between. So if you enter this into the calculator, you'll get a value that's um, somewhere between negative one and three. So we can keep this. All this is negative. This is negative over a positive. This also, that negative number is going to be less than negative one. So this is going to be out, but this is going to be good. How did you get that? Do you plug that uh, Yeah, you can, or I use quadratic formula, which I, which I skipped over because on the quiz, if I give something like this to you, it'll be factorable. You can just factor it and solve for us. But this will be, yeah, this is not factorable. So, but um, the steps are still good. So that's why I still had it on my on my review sheet. Okay, any questions about the steps? Okay, number four. This is the mean valley theorem. This will look identical to the previous problem, except your y values will probably not be the same. Although it could be, but chances are it won't be. And then we're going to have to figure out what that slope value is, and we're going to insert that into the slope slot of our derivative and then solve for x. OK. So what's nice about this function here? Yeah, this is a polynomial. You know the conditions will, will pass with flying colors, so just have to state them. Polynomial has no issues with continuity or differentiability. OK, what's next? What information do we need to gather next? Yeah, find order pairs, right? Don't don't do derivative. OK, don't do derivative yet. We want to find everything that we can find before we worry about that port part. Okay. Back into the original function. Negative one cube, that's negative one plus one minus one. Two cubed is eight. Eight minus two 
6, 6 minus 1 is 5. Okay, what do we do with this information? Find the slope. So I just want you guys to feel like you're doing the same thing as Rolle's theorem, right? I really want you to feel that, except it's very specific with what we're looking for with Rolle's theorem. Find slope. Okay, there's our slope. We'll set that to the side. We're going to use it in a little bit. All right, what's next? Now we can find the derivative, right? So this is a little bit easier than number three because we don't have to go through quotient rule. It's just a nice power rule will get us there. Okay, quick and easy, 3x squared minus 1. All right. Uh, set equal to, do we set g prime equal to 0? Equal to 2, right? Yeah, we do set equal to 0 if it's Rolle's theorem. And we do set equal to 0 if it's, apps, if it's EBT. We set equal to 0 if it's uh, first derivative test, right? There's a lot of times when we set g prime equal derivative equals zero, but not in this case. Rolle's theorem, we want to, we're not looking for slope zero, we're looking for slope two. Okay, I'll be clear on that. Okay, and also make sure that the two doesn't go in the wrong slot, right? This is not an x value, this is a steepness value. That goes in this slot here. Okay, solve for x. Find both sides by three. Take the square roots. I get one and negative one. C is one and C is negative one. But can I keep both? Yeah, negative one is close, but it's not good enough. It's at the end point. It's got to be between if we want to keep it. That's really picky, right? It needs to be between the end points. This one is out. OK, any questions? OK, back page. Okay, number four, uh, number five should be easy here. Um, uh, we're just going through first derivative test, right? So set f prime equal to zero, solve for x, test your intervals, and write all your statements. All right, what's next? Yeah, we're going to use test points. Insert them into the derivative. And then gather information about whether we want to assign those intervals as positive or negative. Okay, so negative three goes in for x. That's negative times negative, which is positive. Plug zero in. Positive times positive is positive. Oops, positive times negative is negative, right? Zero minus one is negative. Positive times positive is positive.
And now this is the easy part, right? Just translate all this into uh, because statements. You have your interval increase, you have your interval decrease, you have your relative max, you have your relative min. Careful that you're writing your because statements for your relative max and relative min. Again, a lot of students leave these out. Into the original. Okay. Good. Original. But when you're doing your sign lines, they have to go into the derivative. If you want to plug the relative maximum for the y value to plug it in, or can you just say like f of two, f of two? Um, f of two, f of one. It depends on the directions. So if I just ask you for, if I specifically ask you for ordered pairs, you got to plug it back into the original function. So you're, it says interval, so mm. not ordered pairs. So you could do f of Yeah, that's fine. For points, I'll accept f of negative two or f of three. Oh, sorry, f of one. Okay, any questions there with four? All right, number five. This is a test for concavity, so we're going to make our way down to the second derivative and then just basically it feels a lot like this test for number five, just with the second derivative. Okay, set equal to zero, factor out the DCF. Place them onto your second derivative sign line. Now you're testing against the second derivative function. Okay. Here's here are my test points. Negative one in for x, I get positive times a negative, which is a negative. Positive times a negative, also a negative. Positive times positive. And concave down, concave down, concave up. How many points of inflection do I have? Just one, right? There's got to be a change in signs. There's no change in signs at zero, so only one point of inflection. Nope. Second derivative sign line, you got to test it with the second derivative. If you plug into the original, you'll get the location, but you won't get curvature information. Yeah, so if you're on the sign line, make sure you're inserting into what, whichever derivative that is, is uh, referencing. So here you're plugging into the second derivative sign line. Here, these test points will plug into the derivative sign line, or sorry, into the derivative function. Okay, careful with your because statements for points of inflection. These are the ones that students leave out. That's into the original. Mm -hmm. 
That's right, it's F3, right? On the quiz, do you want us to actually solve the I may ask you to do that, but I'll be lenient in, in the sense that if you plug in, if you give me the wrong answer, I won't take off points mm -hmm. as long as I'm, I feel like you're putting it into the right spot. But it shouldn't be an issue if you have your calculator. But yeah, I, it's not. Um, I just want you. I just want to know where, you know, how you're looking for that Y value. That's more important to me. OK. Good. Number six. OK, we're going to um, plot order pairs. Get the easy stuff out of the way. Negative four, five. Negative one, negative two. Zero, zero, two, four. Okay. Uh, I have three statements involving slope sign lines, so I'm gonna put that onto a sign line first. Okay, so here, f prime of x is less than zero for x is less than negative one and for x is greater than two. Okay. Can you say this a different way? What does f prime of x less than zero mean? Slope is what? Negative. negative, right. Negative slope to the left of negative one and to the right of two. So here they're also indirectly providing critical, um, you know, sign, um, critical points that you can place onto your sign line. Are we okay with translating that second statement onto our sign line? Okay. F prime of negative one equals zero, F prime of two equals zero. Okay, we'll check that at the end. We just want negative one and two to have slope zeros when everything is said and done. F prime of X is greater than zero for X between negative one and two. Here it's asking for me to put positive slope in that middle, middle interval. Okay, last two statements has to do with my second derivative sign line. Okay, f double prime is less than zero. What is that saying? Mm -hmm. Concave down to the left of negative four and to the right of zero. F double prime is greater than zero between negative four and zero. Concave up. Okay. Are we all comfortable taking these statements and putting it onto a sign line? Okay. Now this feels daunting to have to do all this at once. Let's let's just break it into chunks. Okay. We're not going to do the full graph. We're just going to kind of do a a um, a draft version of the graph. Just we'll, we'll just follow the slope. We don't care about the curvature. We'll just follow the slope to see where the path is going to go, and then we can update that path with more detailed curvature when we get to it. Okay. So I want a negative slope until negative one. So negative slope until negative one. From negative one to two, I want a positive slope. And then from two on, I want a negative slope. So my true graph is not going to veer too far from this path. OK, keep that in mind. We're just now we're going to go in and we're going to kind of update the graph in terms of the curvature, but our graph should follow along the same path. OK, we're not going to veer too far away from this. So are we good with that? OK, so now let's do this. We want concave down up until negative four. There's negative four. Concave down. From negative four to zero, I want the graph to show me concave up. 
You see, I'm, I'm really not changing my path. I'm just making it more detailed. And then to the right of zero, I want my graph to be concave down. Notice that this concave down, I didn't really complete it, right? I, I kind of just did a portion of it because it's got to it's got to remain a decreased slope all the way through, right? Guys, there's one more thing I want to I want to do with you, uh, and that is going back to number. Oh, first off, any questions with seven? OK, I want us to go back to number five. I want to revisit number five. But instead of the first derivative test, we're going to get the same results. For relative max, relative min, but now we're going to try using second derivative tests to see if we can practice those methods. OK. So let's try number five using the second derivative test. OK, same things initially F prime set equal to zero, solve for X, negative two and one. We have our candidates. We know that we're going to ultimately come to the same conclusion as number five, just using a different method. Okay, so the second derivative test, is, we're going to work our way down to the second derivative function. So what's f double prime? Mm -hmm. All right. How do we involve these points and the second derivative function? Plug in, right? Don't set this equal to zero. If we set it equal to zero, we're doing something else. Then we're doing we're doing test for concavity, right? That's not what this is asking for. Okay, so negative two in for the second derivative function. We'll test that first. Negative 24 plus six is negative 18, okay? Because we want to test whether this is a relative max relative min, but we don't want to go through the sign line. We want to go through this alternate method. OK, I get negative 18. What does that tell me? Okay. Negative 18 is less than zero. The number is not that important. It's the sign that's more important. Okay. So negative. Good, so if you can verbalize it, concave down concave down looks like this must be a relative max so we'll say relative max at x equals negative two okay is that consistent with what we got from first derivative test right that's consistent right relative max here okay same problem right just a different um, method okay so let's test one f double prime of one plus 6 is 18. That's a positive number. Because yeah, concave up. That's right, concave up looks like this. If you can verbalize, if you can draw a concave up graph, you should be able to convince yourself that, that there's no way this can be a relative max has to be a relative min. Okay. Consistent with number five, right? Relative max at negative two, relative min at one. Relative min, max at negative two, relative min at one. OK. Um, I have the morning review. If you want to pick it up early, you can. But um, uh, hopefully you guys will get to study tonight and join me for the morning session if you'd like to.